with me. Well, the whole deal is. So, yes. So, here's here's the answer to here's the answer to that. Okay. If the commission was not to go to the other Gentiles, then the Israelites who were scattered, some of them would have been left out from the from the message of salvation. Right. So it had to have happened to the point where not only did the Most High sanction for for the disciples to go to the Israelites, but to the Gentiles also to take out a people for his name from amongst them. So it will not only be Israelites ruling in the kingdom, you need the Gentiles who would also be subjects into this same kingdom. Right. And they would all believe and understand the same thing. See, but Peter understood that his gospel was primarily to the right. circumcision, but Paul's to the uncircumcision. Right. So they can cover both demographics. Right. Like today you have Israelites who just focus on their people. Or just yeah. may focus just on black people and don't know about the other 11 tribes. Mm -hmm. And they don't have any desire to go after those other 11 tribes. Right. You understand? Which we... We understand because at first Peter was like that right. until the Most High showed him the vision with Cornelius. Right. You understand? So when it comes to the gospel of salvation, mm -hmm. every man have an opportunity to partake. Right. But Christ made it clear. Right. You know not what you worship for salvation is of the Jews. Right. So it has to, to be brought from the Israelites to the Jews. Right. Then to the Gentiles. And that's the order. That's the order. That's the order. Some people at first thought we were uh, excluding people, but that wasn't it at all. We had the first go to the people who were lost and get them together and start talking to them. Then it was open where we started speaking to the other people with the new gospel. But it's for everyone. Because everyone is going to serve the Most High in the kingdom, no matter what nation or race you are. Why not learn now? I know, because we're coming from the Jewish community, you know what you're saying? And they were saying, well, we need, we're supposed to be a part of all this as well. And what she's saying to me, we should be a part of all that's happening. So what they're going from is that, because they teach that salvation is for all. Yes, you're saying that. Salvation is for all, but the order... But you're saying it's first to the Jew mm -hmm. and then to the Gentile. But they're finding that difficult to accept. But that's, that's the only thing. Of course, because, it just, just, because it, it changes... It changed the idea of them being the chief people on earth. That's right. They can't accept the idea that it's not so. So that's the, not that people, uh, the majority of those that are out there understand the truth, but they can't accept. You have to realize when society breed you and teaches you and put this in your head that you're above other people, yeah. it becomes a part of your being. True. So to accept the fact that the Lord chose these people, the people I've been taught since birth are nothing, is a, a serious stumbling block for the nations to know that the people who they thought were, were degenerates are actually a road into salvation. That's it. That's it. And that's why it's going to be so much turmoil to get the order reset. Yeah. They're going to be a lot of fighting against it. Yes. <laughs> yes. So any other questions before we go into it? You good? Sis, you sure you got any questions? The opportunity is now. Sure. Okay, go to St. John. St. John, the fourth chapter. And read the 22nd verse. Sword. Oh, it's just my sword. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
We're going to St. John 4, right? And 22. Okay, let's see what it is. This is Egypt, huh? This is Egypt. Yeah. <laughs> right. Nice frames, I like them. Okay. Is my sword? Is my sword over there? Oh, here it is. I got it. All right. All right. Read St. John four and twenty two. St. John, chapter 4, verse 22. Ye worship, ye know not what. So Christ told the Samaritan woman, you're worshiping in this mountain of Samaria, and you have no idea what you're worshiping. Now, she thought that she had some level of inclusion as a people of Israel based on the fact that her foreparents were born in that particular land. But she didn't have the history to know that the original people was in the land before the Assyrians moved them and placed her foreparents there. So by her being born in the land by nature, just by circumstance, she just figured she was an Israelite. And and that would have been the intention. Exactly. Exactly. Therefore, taking on that identity, she claimed Abraham to father. But Christ, we know as a savior, came to set things straight. So it was no coincidence that instead of him going around, he walked through Samaria on his way to speak the gospel. He wanted to make a statement in this particular land. Because these people were not the children of Israel in Samaria. And this woman with near the well was claiming Abraham to father. The same way you have the Jewish people, the Ethiopian Jews, and the other nations claiming Abraham to father today. It's no different. Read. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship. Christ says, listen, we know what we worship. That proves that there's different means of worships. Now, we know that Christ's worship was the correct worship. So Christ said, listen, you worship women and you don't know what you're worshiping. But our people, we know what we worship. So that's a divide there. Read. For salvation is of the Jews. For salvation is of the Jews. Now, when you look at Jews... In the Greek, it's not just talking about the tribe of Judah. It's speaking of the children of Israel. Now, you have to understand the state of the society to know what this scripture is actually speaking of, speaking about here. What people at this time needed salvation? Did the Romans need salvation? No. Did the Samaritans need salvation? They had their own land. They had everything working. No. The people that actually needed a savior were the people of Israel that fell from the promise. No other people needed a savior. The Asians weren't looking for a savior. They had rulership and power. What savior are they looking for? The Romans wasn't looking for a savior. They had Caesar. They had all power. They had army. They had money. They had riches. They're not looking for a savior. So salvation comes from the word save. What people needed saving? The people that fell from the covenant. That's common sense. Read. Verse 23. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. It's going to come a time. Christ is telling them. There will come a time that the true worshipers will come. That means you, you are false worshipers here. 
You are false worshippers up in this mountain. That's what Christ is telling this Samaritan woman. It's going to come a time where the true worshippers will be here. Read. When the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Spirit and in truth. The people have a lot of spirit, but no one is bringing truth with the spirit. So Christ says, listen, it's going to come a time where the true worshippers will worship in this mountain. And they will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The true people will take this place. One point in history. Coming soon. This is what Christ is bringing. This is the understanding Christ was bringing. Read. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. Because the Father himself is seeking these people that were in this land to worship him. He never meant for the other people to worship him from this land. He, that, that wasn't his purpose from the beginning. His purpose was to set up Israelites so that Israel can worship him from Israel. And then tune in yeah. Else. Yeah. Not Edomites worship him from Israel, or Hamites worship him from Israel. It was meant for Israel to worship the Most High from Israel, and and out of Israel would go the law, and decree to all the other lands to worship the Most High in spirit and in truth. But the decree would come from His people. The Most High didn't set up His people from the beginning for nothing. He didn't make a people for himself from the beginning for nothing. Okay? Read. Verse 24. The Most High is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. That's it. You just can't be saying you have the spirit and no truth. Christ says, it's going to come a time the true worshipers will be in this mountain. And the Most High is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Period. Let's go to Romans 11. Romans 11. Romans 11, right? Got it? Let's start at the first verse. Romans chapter 11, verse 1. I say then, have the Most High cast away his people? So here's a question. Here's a question Paul is posing to the church. Did the Most High cast away his people and get another people? That's the question. So... On the back of, of the class we, we went into last night, teaching that the fact that Paul not only taught natural Gentiles, but Israelites who were in a Gentile state of mind, Paul is going to go in depth into those two separate factions of Gentiles. Now, what you had in the church, Paul, if you know the story, I don't want to go through the whole story here, but Paul originally was only teaching Israelites out in front of the synagogue, but he wanted to bring them to Christ. And they, they rejected him on the Sabbath over and over again. And Paul said, you know what, since you're going to reject me on the Sabbath, I'm going to go somewhere and I'm going to teach the Gentiles on the Sabbath. Since you are the people, but you're rejecting it, I'm going to go to the Gentiles. Right? So he started teaching the Gentiles. Was Paul supposed to be teaching the Gentiles in any way? And that was, that was his that that was his mention his mission. So really, he was, wasn't doing what he was supposed to be doing initially. Well, he was though, because you have, you have Israelites who are in a Gentile state of mind also. Paul, don't forget, Paul was raised a son of a Pharisee who understood the law. So his original thing was to go there and teach the gospel and let them know that listen, Christ is Lord. And that was an amazing miracle amongst them because they remember him as a murderer of the church. You understand? But since they started ignoring it, he went into his original sanction. He went and started teaching the Gentiles. Now you have Gentiles, Israelites who are in a Gentile state of mind, 
and Israelites, all these different factions in one church. So obviously people is going to grasp or cleave to their own. So if you have a Gentile in the church, of course a Gentile is going to link in with another Gentile based on the fact of, you know, the familiarity of it. You understand? And if you have people that are from the same neighborhood, they're going to link in with the people of their neighborhood. So this is what's going on in the church. You have the Gentiles now, seeing that the Israelites rejected Christ. They are now making an uproar in the church saying, it's not about you people anymore. It's about us now. You all had your chance in the old covenant. You broke that chance. So y'all don't have anything. We're the people now. So Paul had to write a letter to deal with this argument in Corinthians. And we're going to go into it. See, another thing. It's hard to understand Paul unless you first know the circumstances in which he had to write the letters. That's why Paul's letters are confusing to people because they don't understand the circumstances. Who he's writing the letter to, why the letter is being written. Right? Read the first verse again. Romans chapter 11 verse 1. I say then, have the Most High cast away his people? Have the Most High cast away its people? That's a question. Because we're taught in the churches today that the Israelites are done away with. And now he have a new people called spiritual Israelites. Read. God forbid. That means no. Read. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. The Most High have not cast away his people, which he foreknew. So the Most High did not cast away his people, which he foreknew in the Old Testament. He did not cast them away. Now, if you go into any religious institutions today, they'll tell you Israelites just fell off the face of the earth and no one can identify them. That's they preposterous. That's, that's ridiculous. That is totally ridiculous. How is it you can identify everything in the earth with all this spiritual understanding and you can't tell me who the people are written of in the Bible at all? Like that's taboo to even talk about. You know exactly who these people are. Right? Go down to the 11th verse and let's deal with this argument. Verse 11. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? That means have Israel stumbled to the point where they'll never stand again as a people? The topic here in the first verse is whether or not Israel is done away with. Have the Israelites stumbled that they should fall? Read. God forbid. No. So Paul is letting the Gentiles and everyone know in the church that Israel will not stay in this state forever. You got another Bible? So I'll give you an Another one? Okay. Read. But rather... Through their fall, salvation is come unto the Gentiles. Rather, through their fall, through the Israelites' fall, what happened? Salvation is come unto the Gentiles. Salvation came to the Gentiles to do what? For to provoke them to jealousy. To, to, to provoke Israel to jealousy. So, through Israel's fall, the Gentiles have everything you see in the earth today. What do that shows? That shows that they are in their salvation. Their salvation began when we fell. Mm -hmm. See, we think that salvation is Christ coming to save the earth and bring people into some one tranquility and one peace. But salvation, according to, to the scriptures, is different than that. Salvation is rulership and power. That's what salvation is. By our fall... The nations have become rich. I'm going to show you that in the same verse. That's what Paul is saying. Now, the problem is they want the salvation they received on this side and Israel's salvation too. That's the conflict. That's the conflict. They don't understand that in the earth there's a changing of powers. And salvation go from one empire to the next. But yet Abraham's salvation through Christ have not been fulfilled. At one point the Egyptians had their salvation in power. 
You had the Persians had their salvation and power. The Greeks had their salvation and power. The Romans had their salvation and power. All these empires ruled in the earth. But yet the children of Israel, salvation have not been fulfilled. Now the Israel time is coming around. Everybody want to run into this salvation. But yet didn't want Israel to play an equal part in theirs. Right? So stick with me here. Now they will play a part. There's no doubt about that. But we're going to get the record straight. Because they're misconstruing what salvation is. It says, because Israel falls, salvation have come to the Gentiles to provoke Israel to jealousy. So now that the other nations have their salvation, Israel have become jealous. <laughs> now this salvation can't be the salvation Christ is bringing because there's no jealousy in Christ's salvation you understand Israel wished they had the power the land mass the wealth of the other nations you follow me here read verse 12 now if the fall of them be the riches of the world. That's how we know what salvation was. If the fall of Israel became the riches of the world, that was their salvation. When we fell, they received our riches. All that gold that you read of in the Old Testament to build Solomon's temple, that's the gold that's being you know, resourced all around the earth today. That gold belonged to a people. If we just had the gold in Solomon's temple, our captivity would be finished altogether when it comes to riches and glory. Think about this. So these were the battles, that these religious battles between the Arabs and the Christians, so-called supposed to be about spirituality and all. It was about wealth and power. Who would take Solomon's temple? Why? They read the scriptures. They knew where all the gold was. The greatest goals of, of Ophir and the greatest goal in the earth was built in this temple. It was fighting for the wealth of the earth. So when we fell, automatically, by default, they could fight over what belonged to us. The richest land and all the gold and resources that would fuel the world. Yeah, and they teach us that our heaven happens when we die and float up and be with God. Exactly. Right? Read on. Verse 12. Now, if the fall of them be the richest of the world. If the fall of them be the richest of the world, which means the whole earth got rich. How rich were we? That through our fall, now we understand why the other nations don't want us to come back into any type of power or understanding. <laughs> When you start understanding you are a nation, riches come with that. Power come with that. This will destroy their whole economy in the earth. Huh? Go ahead. Um, so there's something called is it the Comtel program? To the Comtel program that prevent the rise of the Black Messiah. Yeah. You, so each time a leader would arise, you, that is true. Yes. The way you said. It's only when it's a nation. So when somebody would rise up like that, yeah. the next law, these yeah, people, people, they don't mind. Together. Exactly. They don't mind you rising as a religious leader as long as you're under one of the controlled religions. Mm -hmm. They'll give you personal wealth to continue to destroy your people. Exactly. You understand? But they will not give you nation wealth. They will not give you nation wealth in which you can run it as a society and a body alone, independent from government. You would never receive that. Mm -hmm. Why? Because if they do that, mm -hmm. then that takes the wealth from the whole earth. Because if we claim we're Israel, the riches in Solomon Temple belongs to us. The riches, you understand? All the riches in the Middle East belongs to us then. Mm -hmm. So they could never, we can, they, they'd rather us state claim to Africa and say we're Hamites, <laughs> the Israelites. Mm -hmm. Because Solomon Temple is was not in Africa. So listen, go go claim the, the pygmy tribe. 
Go claim some other tribe, but you better not claim Israel. Why? Because riches come with that. And that's why the Jewish people cleave to the... Exactly. Exactly. It was about the riches. It was about the riches. Bless you, bless you. The riches, power, and wealth. Bless you. If y'all need some extra seats, y'all can grab them from next door, okay? Right? Read. Verse 12. Now, if the fall of them be the riches of the world. The Bible says, if the fall, if, if the fall of Israel be the riches of the world. Now, we're talking about salvation here. Read. And the diminishing of them, the riches of the Gentiles. And the diminishing of Israel, the more Israel became diminished, the, the greater the Gentiles became, or the more rich the nations can't, became. That's what Paul is teaching here. Read. How much more their fullness? How much more when Israel come back to their fullness? If the Most High had made the whole earth rich based on Israel's fall, how much more will Israel receive when they are, when they are established as a nation? Read on. Verse 13. For I speak to you Gentiles, and as much as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify my office. He said, I speak to you Gentiles, and as much as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. So when you magnify something, you're making it bigger than it is. So you're putting a magnifying glass on this, and you're actually magnifying it. So he's not just dealing with regular Gentiles. He's magnifying his office to the natural Gentiles too. This is what he's speaking to here. Right? Bless you, brother. Shalom. 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 Read on. Verse 14. If by any means I may provoke to emulation them that are, that are my flesh. So he told the Gentiles in the churches that he did this to provoke to emulation those which are his own flesh. You had an argument going on in the church. You had the Israelites who were staking claim to the truth and understanding of Christ that was trying to attack the Gentiles, and Paul had to write letters against that about trying to put them under the bonds. Then you had the Gentiles sometimes getting out of hand, saying that you people are done away with. It's not about you no more. It's about us. We're in the church. So Paul had to write a letter about that too to keep every, everything temperate in order. Right? Read that last part again. If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are of my flesh. So, the, so Paul did this to provoke Israelites, fleshly Israelites, to provoke them to come back to the Most High. So since the Israelites didn't want to follow, he started teaching the Gentiles to provoke his people to want what the Gentiles were receiving. So the Most High gave the Gentiles all the riches and all the greatness of this earth, knowing that rulers desire rulership. People of power desires power. So if this was in your lineage, you would look at all the riches of the earth and say, you know what? Something is wrong here. I need to go back to the Father who at one point gave my parents and my foreparents all these things. How you feel when you can't pay your rent? You can't do certain things. You can't even rub two nickels together. You can't even do anything. But then you look at the rich, the, 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 the rich governments of the earth who can get, get they, don't have, they don't have, let me tell you, they can operate in the earth without touching the ground. They can fly in great helicopters from one place to the next. They run around with the best cars, the best of everything. There's an imbalance there. But, it, but Paul is letting you know why it's so. He gave the nations all the riches and powers to provoke Israel to anger so that we can come back to the Father that took those resources from us. Go ahead. Yeah. They don't have to, though. It's theirs by default. 
They would not have received those things if we would have kept to the Most High's law. It's theirs by default. And now you have these obstacles that are placed systematically in the way in our society to stop us from ever obtaining this as a nation. Again, like I said, we can, if we were going to sell our people out, you can get it as an individual. If you're willing to sell out and be a part of oppressing thousands, you, you can get some wealth for your personal family. But as a nation, it will never happen. It's, it's systematic. And it's, it's what we're reading right here. We will never come back as a nation with wealth and power until Christ bring it. Period. It's systematic. It's in place. I don't care how much you're talking about financial empowerment, fiscal empowerment, family empowerment. We can talk all the stuff we want. But we can only go but so far based on this curse. Unless you're willing to join the other side. Yes. So they need us to leave us. Yeah, they need us because we are what you you we we are the we are the what you would call uh we are the workforce. We are the force they're feeding on. We are the spiritual source mm -hmm. that keeps things going. Mm -hmm. without, it, it, without the spiritual prayer of Israel, the most high would have been destroyed all this. So they need our prayers, they need our spirituality, they need us to be the force they work on top of. But they need us only at that, capa that capacity. You understand? We're not to rise and to want more than what we can achieve in this little bubble we've been placed in. That's it. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. And that's the children of Israel throughout the four corners of the earth. We are needed in society, but as a nation, we cannot use all our talents for ourselves. It's impossible. Corporations are set up to feed off of all the nations in the earth, to fuel Satan's empire. And if we decided that we wanted to be a part of something separate, it would totally change the whole game. Yes? The sister's question, correct me if I'm wrong too. Go ahead. How, you know, they weren't given the uh, the laws and the statutes and commandments to follow. Yeah. You know, you were asking, how can they then have the riches and carry on? Yes. That was our punishment. For, yes. For the laws wasn't them. given to the nations. So they didn't get it because they followed the most high. They, believe it or not, they're able to relish in riches because they are totally on the left side. They're dealing directly with Satan. So through our fall, riches have come to the Gentiles and all the resources in the earth are being controlled by the principalities and powers of the air. And in order for you to play his game, you must sell your soul. That's how it works. Let's go back to the verses. Come on. Romans chapter 11, verse 14. If by any means I may provoke to emulation, then what's on my flesh? So this was done to provoke to emulation the Israelites who were in the church and Israel as a whole. Paul is explaining why Israel fell as a people and what is the result of their fall. Read. And might save some of them. So he did this so he might save some of them. That Israel may look at the earth and say, you know what? I suppose to have that. And come back to the Father to receive it. That's why it was done. Read. Verse 15. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world. So if the casting away of the children of Israel allowed the whole world to be reconciled and receive all these riches and powers. Read. What shall the receiving of them be? But life from the dead. It says, what, what would the receiving of my people be? It's going to be like life from the dead. Like, he, like we read in Ezekiel 37, the body of the dry bones. It's going to be like someone came back from the grave. How much more would I receive my people? If I can give the, all the earth these riches and power and salvation. 
Read. Verse 16. For if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. That means if the first fruit be holy, everything came out of the first fruit is holy. You cannot, you cannot say you stake claim to Abraham and want to reject Abraham's people. Because if Abraham is holy, the lump came out of him is holy too. Read. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. If the root be holy, which was Abraham, so are the twelve branches that sprang out of the tree. So now you can't say that I'm down with the root and I'm down with Abraham, but yet you will reject the branches that are a result from the root that was planted. And see, and that's what's going on in religion today. In Christianity, they want to stake claim to the promises of Abraham through Christ, but they want to reject the branches that came from the root. Same thing as Islam today. They want to stake claim to Abraham through Ishmael, but they want to reject Isaac and Jacob in the root that came from Abraham. So this is what he's this is what Paul is showing here. So if you're going to accept the root, it behooves you to have respect and figure out where the branches are. Right? Read. Verse 17. And if some of the branches be broken off. And some of the branches were broken off. The northern kingdom. When the kingdom was split under Solomon. If some of the branches be cut off. Read. And thou. Being a wild olive tree. Were grafted in. Among them. So he said you nations. You Gentiles. Who are not Israelites, you are a wild olive tree that was grafted in to this root. You came in contrary to nature because usually you can't take something else and add it to a tree. Read. And with them partakers of the root so, and fatness. So now you came in through Christ. And you have now partakers of all the root and the fatness that was originally promised to Abraham. This is what Paul tells the Gentiles now. Read. And with them, partakers of the root and fatness of the olive tree. So you will partake of all the fatness and riches and glory that was promised to Abraham in Genesis. Read. Verse 18. Boast not against the branches. But he told the Gentiles, now that you've been grafted in, you better not boast against those people that were there before you. You better not boast against the natural branches. Now, the example we give of the institutions boasting is putting up this guy to be Jesus Christ. That's one of the biggest boasters. That, that was a boast. <coughs> Or here's a boast that's actually embedded into Christian dogma or Christian doctrine. That the Israelites are cut off so that the other people can now become God's people. This is what Paul was warning the churches from during his ministry. Read that part again. Verse 18. Read it. Boast not against the branches. It says boast not against the branches. They were not to boast against the branches of the tree, which are the twelve tribes of Israel. Read. But if thou boast, thou bearest not the root. Because if you boast, Gentile, you're not boasting of your root or your history. You're boasting about theirs. How can you boast when you're in their history now? You become a part of their promise. Because now you're boasting, you're not going to be boasting about your root. You're boasting about their root. And that boast is like having Charleston Heston part the Red Sea. That's a boast. That is a boast. Hold up. You're not boasting about your root. You're boasting about these people's roots. There's no place on earth which shows the people of Alexander the Greek or whatever was able to part the Red Sea during the time of the Egyptians. That's boasting. And that's institutionalized boasting. Now, on an individual level, that like Paul is teaching here, it's when you would have us teach 
amongst ourselves that it's not about God's people anymore. It's about us and all people. Or when some people say, well, it doesn't matter if you're Israel. It doesn't matter anymore. That's the boast Paul was warning people against. Read it again. Read that last part. Romans 11 and 18. Read. Boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. And what is the boast? Read it. Verse 19. Thou wilt say then. Thou wilt teach in your doctrine that what? The branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. You are now teaching in doctrine that the Israelites have done away with so that you can be included. So that it's about you now. So you're telling me to forget who we are and accept you as the people. That's the boast Paul was born in the Gentiles against. And he started off with the first verse saying, I say then, if God cast away his people, God forbid. For I am also an Israelite from the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of, Gen uh, of Benjamin. God had not cast away his people, which he foreknew. So the boast is indoctrinated in our everyday learning in the churches today. That's no, Nothing gets me more riled up out there when we're speaking to the people than someone coming to me telling me, it doesn't matter anymore. It doesn't matter. The whole earth is in the state it's in right now because we have, take, we have taken that stance as people. We focus on things that don't matter. And the things that do matter, we say, ignore. it don't. We totally ignore. It does matter. Or Paul wouldn't have wrote this stipulation. What is the boast? Read it again, the, 20, the, 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 the 19th verse. Verse 19. Thou wilt say then. Here's the boast. The branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. You were teaching your doctrine that the Israelites are done away with. That there's no more Israelites. It's about all of us now. That's wrong. Because Paul even taught to the Jews first and then the Gentiles. Yes, it's all inclusive, but there's order. You just can't exclude a people altogether, but yet use the same people's book to teach salvation and understanding. That's backwards. The example I give all the time is like, okay, you have a Chinese book. And I'm going to come from North Philadelphia into Chinese with a Chinese book and tell them with their Chinese book that it's not about them anymore and that I'm the new Chinese. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. It makes no sense at all. So when it comes to salvation, yes, you have to teach inclusion, but you have to give the stipulation that the people know that all people have a place in ministry and we're not to boast against the natural branches. Not only are we not to boast against the natural branches, we are not to try to put the same bonds on the Gentiles as we, as we would put on those of the circumcision. That's what Paul was teaching also. That was an argument going on in the church. As long as they're not dealing with those holidays and dealing with all those other things they shouldn't be dealing with and dealing with food sacrifice to idols and all that, as long as they're doing that, they're fine. If they, they'll look at the law after doing that and they'll follow the law by nature without the pressure. Right? Read. Romans chapter 11 verse 20. Well, because of unbelief, they were broken off. Well, because of unbelief, the Israelites were broken off. Read. And thou standest by faith. And the Gentiles stand strictly by faith. What faith? Faith in Christ. It's through Christ that they will receive what they will receive in the kingdom to come. Read. Be not high-minded, but fair. Now, Paul is speaking to the Gentiles and told them, yeah, I'm going to give this to you, but be not high-minded. You must fear. Fear who? Fear the God of the Hebrews. You must fear the God of the Hebrews. Because don't forget, 
when Moses gave the Israelites the understanding and the laws, it came with do's and don'ts. And this is what Paul is doing for the Gentiles right now. He's given them the laws and the stipulation of being amongst this tree. But he let them know that, listen, look what he did to his people. Now, if you think he did this, look at what he did to his own people. So if you want to receive this, you better understand how to operate with it. Because if he did this to his people, what will he do to you? And that's what Paul is about to bring here. Read. Verse 21. For if the Most High spared not the natural branches, take heed, lest he also spare not thee. If he did this to his people, what do you think he'll do to you? If you come in and try to break these commandments. And as we know, as institutions and as a world, as a whole, the world as a whole, these religious institutions have purposely destroyed the understanding and word of the Most High throughout the whole earth. Throughout the earth. Read. Verse 22. Behold, therefore the goodness and severity of the Most High on them which fell severity. So the Most High will severe against his own people. Read. But toward thee, goodness. But he gave goodness towards the Gentiles. That's why the Gentiles are in good case right now. As a nation, they are in good case. When it comes to riches, power, glory, he was severe against us. Why? Because we had the law. There was no excuse for people of law to fall to the depths we fell as a people. So he was severe against us. If you have two children, two children, the example I'll give, one really don't know better because he's still young, haven't been told, but you got an older one who know all the rules and they break the same law. Which one gets the most punishment? The one who knew better. So that's the same case here. So people might wonder, well, why God is so hard on us as a people? Why? Listen, the Lord spelled it all out for us. He gave us everything we needed to operate as a nation. And look what happened. Read. Verse 22. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of the Most High. On them which fell, severity. But toward thee, goodness. If thou continue in his goodness. So there's goodness as long as we continue in the Most High's goodness. Read. Otherwise, thou shalt be cut off. Otherwise, they will also be cut off. Paul warned them. And, you, and one thing I noticed, churches <coughs> will go into Paul all day long. But not once will you, would you see them go into this chapter like this. They would never go into Paul's writings on the stipulation to the Gentiles. Yes, it was delivered to the Gentiles, but just like it was delivered to the Israelites, it came with stipulation. It came with stipulation. Read. Verse 23. Go ahead. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief. So if the Israelites decide to turn back to the Father, which is happening on a vast rate at this level. If our people decide not to stay in unbelief and start believing again, we shall be grafted in. They can be grafted back in now. For the Most High is able to graft them in again. Why they don't teach us in the church? That the Israelites that were cast away are able to be grafted back into their own tree. That would totally destroy the doctrine that the Israelites have done away with. If these same people or the children of these people who were cast away start believing in the Most High, they can be included back into their tree. Should this not be taught as doctrine in the churches? Read. Verse 24. For if thou were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature. The Most High says, if we were cut out of an olive tree, olive tree, 
if they were cut out of an olive tree which is wild by nature go ahead and were graft contrary to the nature and to a good olive tree and if they were kind if they were grafted in contrary to nature into a good olive tree because that's what happened the most high did something against nature read how much more shall these which shall be natural which be the natural branches be grafted in their own olive tree how much more would those of the natural branches be received back into their own olive tree so yes the most high can receive gentiles but can he not receive his people too that's what Paul is saying here. What's wrong with the churches out there today is they want to like to speak that to say that we're Israelites is totally taboo. It's total taboo to claim that the Israelites are in the earth today. Why? Why is it taboo? It totally destroyed their doctrine. Their doctrine is Israelites are done away with. Read. Listen to this clearly. Verse 25. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery. Paul says you should not be ignorant of this mystery. Read. Lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel. Blindness in part have happened to the children of Israel. Until when? Until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in now according to the scriptures this is a mystery blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in now when it says the blindness in part has happened to Israel what part of Israel was blinded at this point what part huh but what what part was blinded during Paul's time at this time period read for I would not brethren that you should be ignorant of this mystery lest you should be wise in your own conceits that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in you have a strong concordance get me fullness out of the strong concordance we're going to break down a mystery the blindness in part have happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. That is correct, but it only happened to a part of Israel. Because Paul is not asleep, Peter is not asleep. So something has to happen until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in for this whole prophecy to be fulfilled then we're going back to Romans you got fullness mm -hmm. give it to me fullness I need it in the Hebrew I need that in the Hebrew but I also need it I needed the Hebrew and I need it in the Greek I needed the Greek and I need it in the Hebrew the fullness of the Gentile and the Lord says well Paul was mentioning that this is a mystery Let's you be wise in your own conceit. So unless you can break down this mystery, you will not understand this verse. At all. So if you don't have this one understanding, your total understanding of this chapter is gone. You'll be wise under with your own understanding. Give me fullness. Give me multitude. You got fullness here? Give me multitude out of the Hebrew.
got it? Give me multitude and give me the one from Genesis 48. Genesis 48, let me know when you have it. What chapter and verse? Okay. Where you at? Give me the one, the 19th verse. You got it? Mm -hmm. What number is the 19th verse? So 43, 39. Let's get that. We're getting this in the Greek and in the Hebrew to break down this mystery, to show you the importance of understanding what was there before the translation. Blindness, is, blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Let's get the breakdown of what that fullness of the Gentile is. You got it? Okay, what number you have there? <laughs> okay, get that in the Hebrew. Let me know when you have it. You got it? Mm -hmm. Okay. We're going to get it right now. We're at Romans 11. And you just left off at the 25th verse. Mm -hmm. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to the children of Israel, it's Israel, but it's the children of Israel, unto the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Look at what the fullness is in the Greek. Give me that. What number you have? 4138. And give me the meaning for fullness. Fullness. Repletion or completion. What fills as contents, sub supplements, copiousness, multitude. What? Multitude. Multitude. Now, give me multitude in your Hebrew. Give me the number. 4393. 4393 in the Hebrew for multitude. Read. Fullness. All along. All that is. Therein. Fill. That were whereof was. Full. Fullness. To the fullness, blindness in part have happened to the Gentiles. And to Israel. And to the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. So let's see who the fullness of the Gentiles that have to come in. To take away this blindness. Go to Genesis 48 and 19. Start at 17. 48 and 17, I need you to hold Romans 11. Right? You got that right there. Genesis 48. And start at 17. Genesis. Chapter 48 verse 17. And when Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand upon the head of Ephraim. It displeased him. And he held up his father's hand. To remove it from Ephraim's head. Unto Manasseh's head. And Joseph said unto his father. Not so my father. For this is the firstborn. Put thy right hand upon his head. And his father refused and said, I know it, my son, I know it. He also shall become a people, and he also shall be great. But truly, his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his seed shall become a multitude of nations. His seed shall become a multitude of nations. Now we know that Ephraim was over the ten tribes. Multitude breaks down in the Hebrew to fullness. Same word. Nations in the Hebrew and in the Greek breaks down to Gentiles. So when you read Romans 11 and 25, 
For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceit. But blindness in part is happened to Israel. He's talking about the ten tribes that left in 721. Until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Until those tribes come back to the Father. That's what Paul was breaking down. So in order for him to have this gospel go out throughout the four corners of the earth. To allow this to be fulfilled. All nations had to be taught throughout the earth. To fulfill this prophecy to bring back the 12 tribes that will be a light to the world. Y'all see that mystery? Mm -hmm. Now read the next verse. Verse 26. And so all Israel shall be saved. Not just the southern kingdom, but the tribes that left also. That's what Paul is showing here. Not just Judah, Benjamin, and Levi, because those are the tribes that was there during the time of Paul. So he's saying, listen, not just you, Judah, not just you, Benjamin, all Israel shall be saved. All 12 tribes. You with me? Read. Romans 11 and 26. And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion a deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. See that? So he's showing the fall of Israel and the rise of Israel. That's what Paul was showing in Romans the 11th chapter. He was showing how Israel fell and through Israel fall, the Gentiles received salvation, power, and glory within the earth. And that there would come a time where those that didn't believe would begin to believe again and be grafted back in into their own tree. You see that? Why? Because the words that the Most High made to Abraham from the beginning. Read it. 27. Verse 27. For this is my covenant unto them. He made that covenant to them before they were born. So the church's teachings on Israel and the Gentiles are totally false. When you go into Paul's writings and understand Paul's writings... He was given total understanding on the fall and rise of Israel. And also showing that we cannot boast or go against the Gentiles who are looking to serve the Most High also. We can't put our burdens on them and they can't boast against us and say that we are not the people. Read. For this is my covenant unto them. Read. When I shall take away their sins. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes. He says, for concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. Talking to, to, talking to the Gentiles. Read. But as touching the election. But as touching those that who are the elect of the Most High. Read. They are beloved for the Father's sake. But they are beloved for the Father's sake. So Israel is enemies to the Gentiles. But they are beloved by the Father. So what happens when the Gentiles set up institutions and teach the Bible? They teach being an enemy to Israel, but yet they use Israel's book. Go ahead. Verse 29 throws off the uh, Christian teaching that Israel is going to live in. It says, for the gifts and calling of the Most High are without repentance. Yes. The Most High do not repent when it comes to his calling. He will not take back his covenant that he made with Abraham. The Most High do not have to repent of his calling. Y'all see this? You would, you would rarely see Christians at all teach this chapter. Because how can they teach this? And teach the Israelites, Israelites have done away with. My question to those that try to bring up the fact that Israel has done away with, even out there teaching, we go straight to Romans 11, and I'll ask the question. Can the Most High, can the Most High graft back his people if they believe in Christ? Can they, can his people come back if they believe in Christ? And they have to answer it. They have to answer it. Because if that's the case, 
That means they can be grafted into the olive tree, right? Yeah. Now, if the people that were in the olive tree decide not to believe and boast against the natural branches, can they be kicked out? <laughs> yes. So if there was stipulation with God's people, and, and th they being a wild olive tree was grafted in, they was grafted in with stipulation. If we had rules, they got to follow rules too. That's fair. That we, the Gentiles, are grafted into the Jewish nation. That's how they use that scripture. We, the Gentiles, are the ones that are grafted in. Yeah. He ain't trying to say that we are the Gentiles draft, drafted in. See, but by them actually saying that, that's the boast against the natural branches. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. 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 You have to realize the new covenant is a continuation of the old covenant. It's an agreement. It's a continuation of the original covenant. We broke it so that the Most High had to make a new way so that we can receive the promises again. Period. It's a continuation. The Most High didn't just start with the new book. Hold on. Y'all got that? Mm -hmm. A moment. So y'all got that? Finish reading. Verse, uh, verse 30. For as ye in times past have not believed the Most High, yet now have... Read, read, that, read that verse again. Romans chapter 11, verse 30. For as ye in times past have not believed the Most High, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief. He says, at one time you Gentiles did not believe the Most High, but now you have a chance through, your, uh, through their unbelief. You mean to tell me the natural people will not get this same chance? Israelites, the children of, 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 of the Israelites that fell will not get this chance to believe in Christ? Or we must do this as Gentiles? Is that the stipulation? So Paul is bringing all scenarios to the forefront so that it's without question. Read. Verse 31. Even so, have these now also not believed, that through your mercy they also might attempt, excuse me, may obtain mercy. It says, even so have these, talking about the Israelites, also now have not believed that through your mercy they also may obtain, obtain mercy. So he's telling the Gentiles, through your mercy, the Israelites can receive mercy. But the problem is, when the Gentile institutions were established, they had no mercy on the people. They started teaching a doctrine that were against God's people. Read. Verse 32. For the Most High have concluded them, all in unbelief, that he might have mercy upon all. O oh, the depth of the riches of both wisdom and knowledge of the Most High! How unsearchable are his judgments! And his ways past finding out. The most high ways are way past finding out. Read. Verse 34. For who have known the mind of the most high? Or who have been his counselor? Or who have first given to him? And it shall be recompensed unto him again. For of him and through him and to him are all things. To whom be glory forever. Amen. So that's crystal clear. I hope you all understand the teachings of not boasting against the natural branches, the Gentiles, and the Israelites. 
And these were the arguments that Paul was dealing with within the church. Some people might uh, misunderstand Paul's writings because he says in different chapters about, um, about not being under the law. But that argument was stipulated off of certain circumstances that was happening at, at that time in the church. You had Jews like, in, like the Nicolaitans coming in the church trying to force the old covenant on Gentiles. And Paul was saying, listen, they haven't even learned Christ yet. And you're trying to put, him, put them under the things that Christ made them free from. The penalties of Moses. If the Israelites couldn't keep these commandments, how can you force this on the Gentiles? Let them find Christ first, and they will by nature follow the laws of Moses. That's common sense. Don't teach them backwards so they can have the same fall of our people. And see, if you don't understand this, you'll think that Paul was just saying, do away with the law of Moses. He wasn't. That wasn't the argument. But you had people coming into the church strictly to look and see who was breaking the, and upholding the laws of Moses. And that became their driving force to put the church back under the bondage Christ made us free from. That became their driving force. And Paul was like, no, we're not going for it. We're going to go Christ first, then Moses. We're not going Moses first, then Christ. We're not going that way. And because Paul did it this way, more people was able to grasp to the truth because they did it without restraint. Or it wasn't a weight on them to bear the law. They did it willingly. So more people was able to come to the knowledge of the truth because they didn't have to deal with the penalty of death every time they made a mistake. So if you understand this mindset, Paul was on a serious level in teaching the doctrines of Christ. Paul was on one of the highest levels. Now even though they're not accepting him as a disciple during his time, he was just as effective, if not more effective, than the rest of the 12 disciples. You understand? Because he was able to go through and deal in, deal in places the other disciples dared to go. And he became all things to all men that he should gain a few. He wasn't going to let people come in and put restraints on people. Just like amongst us when we teach and we travel all over the place. Even when we were in Philadelphia, you had brothers that would come down and try to look and try to tell us what we needed to do. Yeah, I noticed that y'all, you know, we had a table laid out for brothers so they can eat and drink. And we know you took a long trip. It was like, yeah, brother, like you've been cooking on the Sabbath. I'm like, yeah, brother, we thought you needed something to eat. Do you want some? Yeah, brother, we noticed, yeah, I thought that you was doing something on, uh, I noticed when you were speaking out there on the street, that you had a coffee in your hand, brother, or, or, or tea or whatever. You been, been purchasing a Dunkin' Donuts? I'm like, yeah, brother, it was cold, brother. I drunk tea so I could teach, and by teaching, you're here. You traveled three hours to get here because I was warm enough to teach. <laughs> I thought it was one thing when I seen you on tape, but I noticed ain't nobody in here with fridges on. I'm like, what did you come to Philly for, brother? Did you come to share the word of God? Did you, you come to bring a revelation? Or you come to put us under some bonds? Not that I didn't believe in the fringes. Not that I didn't understand the law that he was bringing. But he didn't understand the grace of the law. And see, and if you... If you, if you understand this, man cannot put you under captivity, under them. People should be free to serve the Most High without the bondage of mankind. And that's what Paul was bringing. I'm not here to bring you under me and have you be my underling. That ain't the point. And that's how Paul was bringing the truth. That's how the disciples were bringing the truth. If they can point out something wrong, automatically that gives them authority over you. So that's why they come with the do's and don'ts. No sooner they step in the door. 
do's and don'ts. You can't do this and you can't do that. That's how the Pharisees and scribes were operating. Brother, where's your bed? I'm like, hey, brother, do you know my family? <laughs> my family don't grow beds like that. I'm like, what did that have to do with the information and the inspiration coming out of the scriptures? What I have on and whether or not I grow a bed. So my bed had to touch the floor for me to have any understanding. Charles Manson have a beard. <laughs> so this is the things that Paul was dealing with during his time. People coming into the church to try to place you under the bonds of the old covenant. So it's not that Paul didn't respect the laws. Paul was a child of a Pharisee. But he understood that you have to be all things to all men to gain a few. If he would sit with those of Pharisee, then he would go into his closet and grab the fringes and put on what the Pharisees would have on. But yet he would bring Christ. If he would sit with someone else, he would have on, you know, what the clothes they have on. So that he don't stand out, but still bring Christ. That's the whole thing. That's the whole understanding. It's places where we can have a metri off. It's a place where we have common sense to tell you to take the metri off. You understand? But I wanted to bring this because it's the same thing in the earth today. People take down Paul because they don't understand Paul's mission. Neither do they care to understand Paul's mission because through Paul, it takes away their authority over people. They don't like Paul. Because Paul makes people free to serve Christ freely. Okay. Yes, go ahead. All right. Backtracking back to um, speaking about the fullness of the Gentiles. Right? Yeah. Um, John chapter eleven, verse forty-seven. Go ahead. Through um, fifty-three. I remember we had brought this out before that um, Caiaphas, the rest of the rest of the um, the scribes and Pharisees and the priests of that time. They was, they, when they came together they, to, to execute Christ, they knew about the other tribes that, that went over. Yeah. They knew about that. So they, they, they knew that Christ had not Christ had to die not only for the southern kingdom, but for the, the northern kingdom as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Bless you. Shalom. How you doing? Shalom. Absolutely. Paul was on a level. And I'm going to tell you, the majority of Israelite groups within the earth today can't stand Paul. Yes. Muslims can't stand Paul. Yes. Christians totally misunderstand Paul. They want to use Paul to say you can't follow the law. When Paul set that straight too. Paul says he consented that the law was good. Because through the law he understood what sin was. How do you know that you're not sinning? How do you know you're sinning if you don't know what the law is? So Paul put a foot in that also. Shalom. Bless you. Get some extra chairs for them. So unless you know the law, unless you understand the law, you don't understand what sin is. Right? You have no idea what sin is if you don't know law. So he consented that the law was good. Matter of fact, let me get a scripture on that. Now, Paul, the churches want to use scriptures like I'm no longer under law, yeah. but under grace. Yeah. That statement itself tells you there's a law. Mm -hmm. Because what are you having grace from? The law. If there's no law, there's no grace. That's common sense. What are you getting grace from? That means you haven't been judged yet. That's what Paul is saying. He's not under law. But under grace. 
you have a grace period in which you have on this earth to get right. Before you were for the judge and be accountable for the laws you broke. Just because you haven't been judged yet doesn't mean that you will not be accountable when you see the judge. So he, when he says that I'm under grace, not under the law, he was telling the Jews that come, in, that come into the church, listen, don't try to put these bonds on the Gentiles. They're learning Christ right now. They're under grace. They're learning Christ. And by following these laws, by default, by following the laws of Christ, you're going to find they're, they're following every law yes. of Moses. By default. By loving their neighbor as they love themselves. They will pick up the law. But Christ is more important. That's what he meant. We're not under the law, but under grace. Give these people time to find out what to do. Some people think that being an Israelite, when you come to the Israelite, it's straight in. Let me figure out the do's and don'ts. And wonder why your family is rejecting you. And you think it's because they don't believe the truth and don't want to hear the truth. No. You become a Pharisee or a tyrant in your house. You come to the house and now you're telling everybody in the house, your parents and everything, what they can't do anymore. <laughs> Instead of walking with the spirit of grace and understanding and truth, and be wise and pick your times. That's what the Pharisees were doing. The Pharisees just come into a room and say, look, you don't have this and you don't have this and you don't have this and you don't have this. Look at what you got on. Look at what you got on. What you eating? What you drinking? Who want to be around people like that? Right? Let's get it. I'm going to open it up and uh, for questions and we can pray out because we're almost done. Right? Mm -hmm. What you have there? He consented that it was good. Mm -hmm. Read it. Seven. Start at the Romans 7 and 1. Romans chapter 7 verse 1. Let's see if Christians are willing to use this scripture. Instead of going to Galatians and try to pull out that the law is done away with. And it's not saying that at all. When it says law, that only means one law. You have to understand what law Paul is talking about in any particular chapter or verse. They paint it with a broad brush to make most people believe that it's talking about the law of Moses when every time he says the law. And it's not. He signifies what law he's speaking of every time. But if you just want to be a person to eat what you want and do what you want, you will use that scripture to say all the laws are done away with. Okay, if that's the case, like I said before, when you pass the pot in your church, I will be the last one, and I will take the pot. What's wrong with that? There's no law. The law's done away with. I'm under grace. So let that pot go out. I will be the last person waiting for that for that basket to come around. Okay, this is okay. Thank you. This is mine. I, thank you. Okay. <laughs> Don't look at me wrong. I'm under grace. Thou shalt not steal. That was that was under the law of Moses, right? <laughs> You see how they pick and choose what laws you can follow? Mm -hmm. They put down the Most High's law, but yet they'll have laws in the church, and if you break these laws, you are dismembered. Right? Read Romans 7 and 1. Read it. Romans chapter 7, verse 1. Go ahead. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law. How that the law have dominion over a man as long as he liveth. So now he's speaking to those that have the law. So in order for him to get to these brothers, he have to use what they're used to. But he's still teaching Christ. He said that the law have what? Have dominion over a man as long as he liveth. No, brother, the law is done away with. That the law have dominion over a man as long as he liveth. So how can you say the law is done away with when Paul wrote Romans the seventh chapter? The law have dominion over a man as long as he liveth. 
Read. Verse 2. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. Now, what law is this talking about right here? Thank you. So it's specifying what law. But if you don't know this and you read a chapter or verse down in the chapter, you would think the law was done away with when he was just talking about one law. So when Christ said, when Paul says we're not under law but under grace, the majority of the time in the chapter is talking about the penalties of the law. It's talking about the penalties, the fact that when you sin, immediate death or execution or persecution will not come. Because with the laws came penalties. So you're under grace when it comes to the penalty for you breaking that law. So if you still kill or whatever you do, you might not be judged right now because you're under grace. But don't think the Most High is not going to pull it up on the day of judgment if you haven't repented from it. That's what Paul was speaking about when he says you're not under law but under grace. You're under grace from the penalty of the law. Christ was hung on a cross so that you don't get killed. That you have a chance to regroup and to repent from your sins so you don't go in a killer, a thief, whatever the, the laws are. <coughs> are you all following me here? So that's what it means. It doesn't mean the law is done away with. And because people misinterpret the Bible through Christianity, you have other people claiming that Paul was trying to get people away from the law. Like Muslims. They go against Paul. Everyone is against Paul. Read, read the fact that Paul says that he consent that the law was good. Verse 6. Excuse me, verse 7. What shall we say then? What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Is the law wrong? God forbid. No. So why can't the Christians pull this one out? The law is not sin. Read. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. You don't know if you're sinning if there's no law. So how can you get right with the most high if you don't know what the law is? So these are the scriptures you must pull out to show them that the scriptures they're going to, they have no understanding on. You can't use Paul to purposely break the most high's law because Paul understood the law. He was a child of a Pharisee. But he also understood how to operate with people that were without the law. To show them the grace of the law so that they can learn Christ and then they can start applying the laws by nature. They have an opportunity that our foreparents didn't have. We had Moses. But those after Christ have Christ. So that gives us a leg up. With Christ, we have grace to learn all the laws, including the laws of Moses. But Christ's laws are more important. Read. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. See that? How would Paul know what lust is if he would not have read the law of Moses that said, Thou shalt not covet? He would have no idea what it was. So he consented that the law was good. He didn't say the law was done away with. And see, that's what these guys try to do, like the like uh these Israelites that don't want to believe in Christ, uh uh these Muslims, they want to try to play Paul against Christ. They try to play Paul against Christ, make you question Paul. When really, the unlearned is not on, on a level to understand Paul. Christ did the same. Don't forget the Pharisees tried to interrogate Christ for sitting among sinners and publicans and people that was known as sinners. They wanted to totally take, take Christ out based on the fact that he didn't want to sit up there with the wise men and the people. He said, listen, you already whole. You don't need a physician. I'm going to the sick. Now Christ couldn't go to the sick and every time he's around them, he's pointing out everything they're doing wrong. 
His life around them allowed them to convert. Him naturally being around them, showing them the way to be, allowed these people to come to him and come to the truth of the Most High. So you have to watch these guys that's out there always telling you what you should, what you should be doing, but yet they're not doing anything. None of us are perfect. None of us, believe it or not, can hold a match to Christ. None of us. Read. Now, I need you to go to um, read about uh, consent that, that it was good. Uh, verse 16. Read that again. 16. Verse 16. If I then, if then I do that which is which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. I consent to the law that it is good. And this is the chapter you all need to pull out on Christians that say the law is done away with. Okay? That claim that Paul is not dealing with the law of Christ. Read the 12th verse. Verse 12. Wherefore, the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just and good. Period. It's holy, and it's just, and it's good. But yet, we're not to use the law to put bonds on people. To force them. If a person is being forced to follow the most high. In their conscience. They're still not following the most high. They really want to do something else anyway. Mm -hmm. They're not really following the most high. They're doing what they need to do. Based on total force. Go to Romans the second chapter. Hold on. Okay, let me give you a few examples real quick on 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 law and grace real quick. According to the law of the Sabbath, Here's the law of the Sabbath. You're not supposed to do any shopping from Friday sundown to Saturday sundown. Any shopping for your own acquaintance. Or do the things you would normally like to do for yourself in pleasure during the week. That's the law. Right? And if you break the law, if you were, if you were caught working or doing any of these things besides resting, Someone found you, the law is to put you to death. And these are laws I can read in the Old Testament. You're supposed to be dead on the spot. Right? Now, Christ hung that penalty on the cross. Here's grace on the Sabbath. I'm not supposed to shop because I know it's against the law. But yet, I run into a guy. Or well, I know someone who needed a pair of shoes. He's homeless. He's doing bad. And I run into him and he needs some shoes. And I go up the street on the Sabbath and break the Sabbath and buy him some shoes right <coughs> now and give it to him. Right? Now, even though I have so-called broke the Sabbath, I have kept the Sabbath. Why? Because I show love to my fellow man on the Sabbath. And the Sabbath was made for man. 
not the other way around. And that's what Christ was showing when he was going through the corns and was plucking the corn. And the disciples started eating the corn on the Sabbath. He had the Pharisees sticking their head out, the Pharisees. Hey, what's going on? What y'all doing with corn? <laughs> out here on the Sabbath. They was working all night teaching the gospel. Should they not eat corn? They're sticking their head out. And what are you doing in a corn patch on the Sabbath? Seeing me take corn on the Sabbath. <laughs> so Christ says, if your ox fall in a ditch, will you get it out on the Sabbath day? And you don't realize oxen is worth money. You, you can't plow without oxen. You don't get your fruit. You don't get none of that because you need your oxen to plow and make everything work. And you don't travel without your oxen. So he says, if your ox fell in a ditch on the Sabbath, which one of you will go and get it out? Which one of you? Of course you'll get your ox out of a ditch. So are the people more worth than oxen? If our people is out in a ditch, should I not go to get them out of the ditch? You had people try to come against us because we taught out on the street on the Sabbath. What are you doing out on the Sabbath, brother? Shouldn't you be in the synagogue? Listen, brother, the most high dwelling temple not made with hands. The temple of the people. I'm not in no synagogue. I'm out here getting our people out of a ditch. So this is what happens. And this was these are the same things that was going on during the time of Paul. You have people that try to put you under the same bonds of the old covenant without giving you time to adjust to the change. This is a life-changing understanding, knowing that you're Israel or learning the truth of Christ or whatever the case is, and you're not going to get everything one day. And you don't need somebody over you every moment telling you what you are not doing right. Okay? Let's get wrong with the second chapter. Let's read Romans 2. And let's start at the 23rd verse. Romans chapter 2 verse 23. Thou that makest thy boast of the law, who breaking the law, dishonorest thou the most high. So if you're making boast of the law, but yet you're breaking the law, that's dishonor the most high. You're boasting about you need to follow this and you need to follow that, but yet you're breaking it yourself. Read. Verse 24. For the name of the Most High is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as it is written. For circumcision verily profiteth, if thou keep the law. So circumcision profiteth only if you keep the law. We. Oui. But if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. So Paul is telling those brothers that are looking to put binds on the people, that if you break the law, you're no different than the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. Just because you are people of the law, if you break the law, you become no different than everyone else. Because what makes Israel different is the fact that they receive the law, statutes, and commandments of God. Read. Verse 26. Therefore, if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? So if the Gentiles keep by nature what's in the law, should not their uncircumcision be accounted as them following the law? If they're doing right, should not we count them as we count you when you do right? We? Verse 27. And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge thee, who by the letter and circumcision doest transgress the law? For, for he is not a Jew, which is one outward. Now there is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew, which is one inward. And circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of the Most High. So being an Israelite is deeper than just your physical father. That's what Paul is showing here. Because to be a Jew, you must follow the laws of Christ. Not just have the law of Moses. That's what he's showing here. It's not just the outwardly. 
And that's what we tell brothers who try to look at the fringes and see, ask us where our fringes are and where is the beard and where, listen, a Jew is not a Jew outwardly. It's not because the Pharisees and scribes had the best clothing during the time of Christ, but were they on the level of Christ? No. All right. The chapter about covering the head was Romans the 11th chapter. That was a chapter we went into about covering the head while praying and prophesying. Okay? You're not supposed to cover your head. Okay? But just for edifying, we don't cover our head. That's why the crown of our head is open. We're praying and prophesying for edifying. That's somebody asked a question online there. All right. I want to go into the law. We've finished that. We finished that portion of that, and uh, they hate Paul. Someone asked, why do Israelites hate Paul? The, the Israelites hate Paul because they think Paul is trying to do away with the commandments. They don't understand Paul. They think Paul would like to do away with the commandments. And they and some people think that following the law of Moses is their righteousness. And Paul was focusing on Christ opposed to Moses. All right. When praying, prophesying, or in the Bible, Corinthians 11 chapter says a woman's head must be covered. When in the scriptures. But... If uh, instead of being contentious, contentious, excuse me, if one is contentious, then there is no, no such law. Which means if a person want to argue about it, let him be. Uh, we're not going to put up any videos of us touring through any country. We don't do that. All right, any, any questions do y'all have before we uh, break down? And Okay, go ahead. I heard in you, okay? Yeah. Remember, Darren was saying that Yeshua died for the children of Israel. Is that if I got that correct? Okay, the question is, did Christ die for the children of Israel or the whole world? And that's a tough question there. All right? Because through his death, all humanity will live if they accept him. Okay? But when it comes to scripture, he, he was sacrificed for those that were under the law of sacrifice. To redeem them which were under the law. Get Galatians 4 and 5. Let's get it. Read that. You started four, yeah. Galatians chapter four, verse four. But when the fullness of the time was come, the most high sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. Made under the law, read. Verse five. So for to redeem them that were under the law. To redeem them which were under the law. So the people that needed to be redeemed from under the law were the children of Israel. They broke the law and they needed, they needed redemption. So that was a, Christ's original purpose. But through that, all mankind who receive them will be saved. Will be saved for the kingdom of heaven. To the Jew first, then the Gentile. Okay. There was no need for him to die for those which were 
not under the law of sacrifice because the law of sacrifice was only given to one people the law of sacrifice was never given to Hamites or Asians or any other people but by them following the true children of Israel and the gospel of Christ they will be partakers of that tree we read up in Romans 11 chapter that's common sense if he was that savior for all mankind then there was, there's no reason the Romans would want him dead. You understand? The Romans needed him dead because he was looking to deliver a people who the Romans were making money off of. How can you be king when Caesar's king? So he was coming to be king of Israel. Now all nations will serve Christ and will partake of this kingdom if they follow him. But that original sacrifice were for those who were under the sacrifice. Yes. Oh. This Luke chapter 2 verse 34. Read it. And Simon blessed them and said unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the four and rising again of many in Israel. And for a sign it shall be spoken again. That's a perfect scripture. That's a perfect scripture. It's a good precept. Go ahead. No. Go down to the uh the sixty eighth verse. You in Luke two? Go down to the sixty eighth verse. Hold on. Who's this? One moment, I'm sorry about that. Luke 1 and 68, go ahead. Go ahead. Now blessed be the Lord's power of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people. Go ahead, down to 70. And have raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began. There it is. All right. So when you go into John 3.16, For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. You have to get the precepts on John 3.16 to get the full understanding of what that's speaking of. Yes. They use that to, to try to boast against the natural branches without the precepts to prove that that world is the world that of Israel. The, the whole earth will get blessed based off of this world being established in the earth first. That world is not talking about the entire earth. Mm -hmm. Earth and world are two separate things. World means eon or society. If you go down, if you go into China, they got their own world. You go into the Middle East, that's a new world. Over in Europe is a world. You can break it down to every level. You go into the gay community, that's the gay world. <laughs> So, world just means societies. It doesn't mean the entire earth. How, how do we know that? When you use the precepts. And this is, that's why the Lord says, Through thy precepts, thy get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. If you try to read the Bible without the precepts, you will not get the understanding. How do we know what world Christ was talking about in John 3.16? Go to St. John 13 and 1. Go ahead. St. John, chapter 13, verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Yeshua knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father. Having depart out of this world from the Father, read. Having loved his own, which were in the world. Having doing what? Having loved his own, which were in the world. Having loved his own, 
which were in the world. Read. He loved them unto the end. He loved them to the end. So now we have to focus on who are those which were in the world that Christ loved to the end. Go to St. John 17 and 9. St. John chapter 17 verse 9. And I'm sticking in St. John because St. John that wrote John 13 that wrote John 17 is the same John that wrote John 3 16. So I stick in the book of John. Read it. I pray for them. St. John 17 and 9. Read it again. I pray for them. Christ I, says, I pray for them. Read. I pray not for the world. I pray not for the world. So one chapter, John is saying, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. But in here, he says, Christ's own prayer is saying, I pray for them. I pray not for the world. So what world was it talking about in John 3.16? We'll get it. Read. But for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. But he's praying for those that the Most High gave him while he was in the world. Okay, so this didn't include Pontius Pilate or, 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 or Nero and any other cast that was trying to go against him. It didn't include these, these characters. That wasn't accepting him. Only those that accepted him is who he prayed for before he died. This this universal teaching of all inclusion and everybody, no matter who you are, no matter what you believe and what you follow, is total Satan worship. The kingdom is for a few that receive Christ. That's who Christ is praying for. Right? Let's get some more. Let's go to St. John 3.16. Go two verses up. Start at the 14th verse. Start at the 13th verse. St. John chapter 3 verse 13. Go ahead. And no man have ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Now what people was the serpent lifted up to in the wilderness? Now the serpent represents the phylactery you see in medicine. The little serpent wrapped around the stick. What happened was you had a bunch of unbelievers marching with, with uh, Israelites marching with Moses. Gone is the land of Canaan. On the way to the land of Canaan. And you had some people that didn't believe that Moses was the one that was chosen. So the Most High sent snakes among them. And the snakes started biting and killing them. And killing them off in the wilderness. So the Most High told Moses. Wrap that snake around a stick. And hold it up. And those that believe that you are the one I chose to do this. When the snake bite them. They'll live. You understand? So read that, read that again. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. That's the phylactery. Read. Even so must the son of man be lifted up. Now what people was the phylactery or the serpent lifted up to? In the wilderness. Exactly. It was the children of Israel. So shall Christ be lifted up. Mm -hmm. same. The same thing. And those that believe on him will be the ones that make it. You understand? But you also have the Gentiles, and I want to put this again. The Gentiles that believe in Christ will make it too. They will make it for their purpose in the kingdom of heaven. Read. Verse 15. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish. Who's the whosoever? Because most the Christians say whosoever means everybody. No, it's whosoever out of the people he's speaking to. How do we know that? Hold the whosoever and go to Joel 2 and 32. Joel 2 and 32. Right? 
And I also need you to get the one in Acts. Go ahead. Yes. What was your question again? You got it? Get that? Go ahead. Joel 2 and 32. Mm -hmm. This is also a key location when it comes to our deliverance today. Read that. Joel chapter 2 verse 32. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered. Same thing we read in John 3.16. Read. For in Mount Zion. In Mount Zion. Who are the people of Mount Zion? Israel. Read. And in Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, read. Shall be deliverance. Shall be deliverance. Acts 2 and 22. Dealing with the whosoever. Acts chapter 2 verse 22. Go to the 21st verse and read down to the 22nd verse. Acts chapter 2 verse 21. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The same exact passage in John 3.16. But let's see what the precepts say right after that. Ye men of Israel. Who? Ye men of Israel. Who? Ye men of Israel. Read. Hear these words. Hear these words. So the whosoever was out of the people he was speaking to. So you see how the Christians meticulously, meticulously use certain words like world, whosoever. They use these words meticulously to teach this universal doctrine to exclude the children of Israel. Y'all see that? Now let's go back to St. John 3 and 16. St. John chapter 3 verse 16. Go ahead. For the Most High so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Go to Isaiah 45 and 17. Isaiah chapter 45 verse 17. Read it. But Israel shall be saved in the Most High. Who shall be saved in the Most High? But Israel shall be saved in the Most High. Read. With an everlasting salvation. How long is everlasting? How can you say Israel is done away with? Read. Ye shall not be ashamed. The Bible says Israel shall not be ashamed. Read. Nor confounded. Nor a confounded. No longer will they be confused. Read. World without end. The Bible is calling Israel a world without end in itself. Israel is being called a world in Isaiah 45 and 17. So what world is it talking about? Was it talking about the Asian world? It was talking about the children of Israel. And now the children of Israel are established. Then light can come from these people to the world. And the new government can be established with Christ at the pinnacle, the 12 disciples, the 144,000, and the children of Israel, and from Israel shall go the law. That's crystal clear. Any other questions? With new bodies. Hmm? With new bodies. And new, new bodies. A different body. A glorified body. The bodies we were meant to have really from the beginning. Death is a curse. When Adam took of this tree of good and evil, it did something to our physical forms. It did something to our bodies. Well, now we're subject to death. It's actually something was taken on through Adam. Death is a curse itself. We are eternal beings. We're not supposed to die. Exactly. And you see, and see the spirit have an impact on the outward. That's the thing that they're not teaching. 
The spirit has an impact on our outward. We can do things with our spirit that we haven't touched on yet. You notice when Christ came back with the, with the resurrected body that they didn't recognize him. He was taller than he used to be. They totally didn't recognize him at all. They walked with him and talked with him and all that and didn't even know him until he told them who he was. It's an entirely different it's an entirely different body. The scriptures tell you in Luke that Christ was fairly short. In Ezra, it tell you that in Second Ezra thirteen, it tell you that it was a man taller than all the rest, with putting crowns on their head. So in a glorified body, Christ is very tall, but when he walked amongst us, he was short. So these are cursed bodies we're in. These are totally cursed bodies. We have the bodies of Adam. But we'll take on the spirit and body of Christ. The immortal. If we believe in him and we're part of that change, that's what we're fighting for now. Right? Any other questions? <clears throat> Any more questions before we start anointing? Because our time is running out. Any any questions at all? Okay. Someone ask a question here. Are the people that are born with both intersex the the eunuchs that the Bible says will be born. I don't understand the question. You have to ask answer that again. I don't understand about the inter that word intersex thing. Oh, that's what they're talking about. Okay. Well, let me let me turn off the recording. Talking about both members.